All right. Welcome, everybody, and uh, and welcome, Charles Vaughn, who's agreed to come and present uh, uh, on the topic of content security policies and WebAssembly um, and how that interacts and, and what, the relationship to CES. And maybe uh, so maybe we can uh, use this time for to converge on some shared ideas. Uh, uh, take it away, Charles. Yeah. All right. Um, share. Oh, need to... maybe uh, share screen. Oh, his speaking, of, speaking of permissions capabilities. All right, here we go. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to leave it out of presentation mode because I've found that that sometimes messes things up. Um, can people see it okay? Yes. Like yeah. size wise? Okay. The joys of using a high DPI window system and presenting. Um, through the various screen share apps. It causes me a lot of agita, but so. Um, so WebAssembly and SES. Um, so for background, think of WebAssembly as a VM inside of a VM. And the idea behind WebAssembly is that you provide a bytecode that system level languages and by system, we mean kind of like the C, C++ Rust, um, the ones that don't necessarily need like runtime support. Um, so you can compile that. <clears throat> so your source language is something that's like C and a JavaScript JIT um, uh, is able to optimize it. This has a history with ASM.js, which is a pure JavaScript target. Um, one way of thinking about WebAssembly is, is it's an optimization for the ASM.js use case. Um, so, um, another, uh, another sort of full disclosure here, I'm going to be referring to things as they exist now. There are specs and proposals in place that may slightly modify this, but you can sort of think of those as like bolt-ons and not like fundamental shifts to the technology. So there's a GC spec currently um, in, in place, but it's not, it's not like core to how WebAssembly works. So it's fundamentally heap oriented. Um, so you have a linear view of memory. Um, you don't have like built-in runtime functionality. WebAssembly doesn't care about your variable types. Um, and um, really what your WebAssembly object, which, in, which is referred to in, in a very um, uh, kind of common and not confusing at all way when it comes to the web is, is its module. So WebAssembly modules is it exports functions that represent the WebAssembly code as well as primitive variables. Um, and then how it is able to interact with the world is through an import system. Um, the interoperation between WebAssembly and its host environment. Um, so on the web, that's JavaScript. Um, you can grab um, uh, tools like WASM time, WASMer that actually allow you to use like to host it inside of C. I think there are Python embeddings. So basically you WebAssembly is like the VM inside of another VM. So how it interacts with its embedder with its host is um, through the primitive, through a really small set of primitive types. So you've got your two sizes of integer and your two sizes of float. Um, and then anything higher level than that is going to be going through the WebAssembly's memory, which is um, visible to both WebAssembly and and the host. So pointer marshaling, you know, um, boxing, packing, how all the million different ways. It's WebAssembly doesn't care. Again, asterisk. There are proposals to sort of flesh this out in a more general way, but at least for now, it doesn't really care. Um, so <clears throat> the actual WebAssembly execution environment, um, again, we're, we're compiling native code, which has a lot of its own special security implications. Um, you know, all the, all the fun things you can do to a C program, especially one that was written, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, uh, so for example, the main execution stack is inaccessible. That's managed by the host. The, the WebAssembly program doesn't have a way of viewing it. Um, that being said, 
oftentimes for things like var arg functions for stack allocated variables like mscripten for example i believe rust does as well maintains like a shadow stack um uh so for the most part you you can't mess with control flow too much um and um furthermore control transfer um inside of a function you can only control transfer uh transfer control to like certain specific parts in that function based on um the, the the labels in there and then you can only transfer out control outside of a function to the very start of that function so things like um uh gadgets um all, all the fun ways we have of bypassing aslr um become dramatically less effective um, because you can't arbitrarily decide to like jump to a certain point in the execution um, function pointers uh are explicitly typed. Um, and so this provides like control flow integrity um, of, of, a, of kind of a simple case. There are, I believe there've been some experiments to add additional control flow integrity based on filters to functions, but just in general, being able to prevent um, function pointer confusion to only the ones that maintain the same types provides, you know, increased security over like your base unsecured native executable um. <clears throat> yeah so you can't for example you can't have a function pointer that points to something that returns a void and takes in an integer but something that returns uh, a, a double and takes in two integers um, you'll, you'll get an error or you'll actually go to a completely different function um, so a quick example to, to sort of help kind of ground like the concepts. This is a very simple WebAssembly module. This is in the WAT, W-A-T format. So it's like the, it's the, the text equivalent format. So we can see here the imports. Uh, it's importing a memory. Uh, one, I believe this is 64K. So like there's in the spec, like this is, it's basically a page count for like virtual WebAssembly pages. So this is 64, K of memory, um, and it's importing a log function, which we can see here is um, uh, strongly typed that takes in um, two and 32 functions. <clears throat> this is a constant, this is like a, a data section in a regular C++ program. So this specifies initializing that memory. And then finally, we, we're exporting a function you call on this called hello. So once we initialize this object, we'll get our module dot hello um, that takes in no parameters um, and pushes these two parameters to the stack and calls our log function. Um, I guess I... I'm trying to see if I actually mentioned it. So everything in... Um, uh, in WebAssembly is, it's all, it's, it's like stack oriented and the stack is validated at compile time. So you can't actually have, um, there's a validation pass. So you can't have things where you, you, you have like the wrong number of arguments. There's a white paper for those, um, interested. Um, so yeah, so we call our log function with zero and 13, um, uh, and like our log function could be anything. It could just print out zero and 13. Um, in this case, let's, we'll actually see what it does. Um, so we first initialize the memory and our log in this case is gonna take an offset and a length. Um, it takes a, a UN8 array view of the memory buffer. Um, decodes the raw bytes there uh, from the offset and length as UTF-8 and then logs it out. So kind of what we think. But again, this is sort of the interoperation between WebAssembly and the host has to go through these like primitive types. So if you want to build like, if you even want a string, you have to do this type of marshalling. And then from there, it's pretty, you know, fetch these, it's all asynchronous. So fetch it and then instantiate from the actual raw bytes and and then pass in our imports. And then from there, we can call um, our hello function. Um, 
And so just like taking, taking a look at like WebAssembly is, it's got all the hot, it, it checks all the hot 2020 secure code execution um, specs. It's permissioned by default. Uh, it contains strong mitigation for most uh, common security issues. Uh, there are potential vulnerabilities with Spectre type attacks, but like who doesn't have those these days if you are connected um, synchronously with your code. Um, there is, uh, at least in Chrome, I think in Firefox now, they do do host isolation. Um, so if you're in an iframe, you can't do a Spectre type attack on your embedder. Um, so what's kind of the point of that, that's where it stands now, but what about like doing better? So um, Chris mentioned CSP, I, I, for some reason I just didn't include it in here. So the bottom line is like right now, WebAssembly is in this weird CSP spot. Um, on Firefox, it's just enabled, it's not gated by CSP. On Chrome, it is gated by CSP. However, you can um, have a worker instantiate the module it, with a reduced CSP and then pass that module to the actual um, main page that has a more restrictive CSP and that'll work. And then for Safari, it's just not gonna instantiate at all. So kind of the idea is like where, what do we actually like need security wise um, for a good secure implementation of WebAssembly? So um, kind of the first thing is that actual list of imports, especially in larger, more complicated projects, tend to provide the world. Um, and script ins, inbind interface, I believe Rust's sort of default interface provide like basic machinery for accessing like arbitrary window objects and uh, calling their properties. Um, <clears throat> so you basically, uh, project gets large enough, you've provided enough things um, to be able to execute arbitrary JavaScript code, even though you can potentially have locked down CSP. Like if we look at this example, this import, you can get, you can look at this and you can guarantee the only thing this is ever going to be able to do is going to be able to log strings. Like maybe it's gonna log like a really long string or it'll like leak information, but this isn't calling external resources. Um, you know, this isn't, um, evaluating arbitrary JavaScript code, you can look at this and evaluate it. But as the complexity increases, they tend to basically give away the whole um, farm. So the ideal world is as a developer shipping a WebAssembly module, you should be able to reason about the capabilities provided to a WebAssembly module. You should be able to make statements like, there is no way that this module is able to make an XHR request. There is no way this module is able to do anything other, if it ever makes a fetch request, it's always to this URL endpoint. Um, like I said, it's easy for kind of simple imports. We can go through and just be like, all right, what's the threat model here? What's it able to do? Um, but the complexity grows, our ability to make that evaluation decreases. Um, okay, can I, can I interject? Um, yeah, was, think, yep. Yeah, I think we need to be very careful to distinguish uh, <clears throat> the emergent effects of um, that are, are just in inherent in writing uh, large complex systems mm -hmm. uh, versus the constraints that come from trying to port legacy code. Yes. Uh, the, the, um, the negative results that you're stating here, I think are very strong for legacy Yes. For, for, for fairly substantial systems, but systems constructed by the principal least authority going in, yeah. um, I think this picture is much more negative than the reality of, of the way you can build systems when you're doing it from scratch. Yes, yeah, I, I agree. And I, I, yeah, there's there's definitely nuance here. And I, I, I've actually like thought about like, could you come up with a way of like, you know, some subset of like JavaScript that you can prove, like for example, like doesn't exhibit certain behavior. And so it could be arbitrary complexity, but at the end of the day, you know, for example, because we restrict, because it's so restricted, um, you, you know, if you don't actually give it the ability to 
extract a string from a memory buffer, like it, it's not going to be able to, you know, make a fetch request. Um, so well, and, if, you, if you don't yeah. give it fetch, I mean, the, the, the thing yeah. is uh, JavaScript and WASM uh, bo are both starting with a very, very clean separation of user mode pure computation versus capabilities for uh, causing IO to the external world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, WASM by being a flat address space internally, uh, clearly for an individual WASM instance, it can follow foul its own nest very easily. Yes, yeah. But, uh, but, but that, that puts it in, that puts WASM as opposed to JavaScript in a more of an operating system granularity with regard to what the units of protection are. But between these units, between the module instances, you can still have really quite strong capability protection. Uh, one of the things that I think is very weird about the CSP orientation to all this uh, um, is that it's not evaluation of code. It's not Turing universality that is the source of the danger. Right. Um, the source of the danger is what abilities it has to cause effects outside of itself. Yeah. Um, so I think one thing it's worth it's worth keeping in mind is that really the only thing you need to get to get, um, to get a, a WebAssembly module, um, you know, potentially malicious one to, to give away the farm is is pretty is is somewhat relatively simple building blocks. Um, the ability to kind of convert a memory object to a string, the ability to to reference and look up objects from like the window objects. So I guess the question is, is like how easy are those sort of gadgets to find and validate that? Um, uh, I guess the way I'm thinking about this is. Um, when, Bill, you say, yeah. when you say to find, it's it's like the, 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 talking about it as how easy is it to find implies that if you look harder, you'll find it. Sure. Whereas if you don't, if you don't provide it, then it's not there to be found. Yeah, yeah. I guess I'm using find in in kind of a, a confusing way. More, it's just like is if you're building. Um, if you're building these WebAssembly systems, especially to provide, like, let's say you want to provide, like, um, you know, a, just a, a general way of, of creating DOM elements, is that likely to lead to something that provides more general utility than you're expecting? Right. Well, the DOM itself is a very, very confused bag of authority. So yeah. if you just provide direct access to the DOM, you've already given away the farm not because of anything to do with WebAssembly. It just sure. has to do with the fact that DOM itself is a very confused mixed bag of authority. Uh, and so that creates a separate problem, which has nothing to do with WebAssembly, which is finding ways to refactor the authority present in the DOM so that those authorities can be divided up and separately handed out. Yeah, and we've seen some, there's been some work with that with um, like trusted types, which I think is very promising. Um, but, but yeah, I, I, th I think, uh, so for those who don't know, trusted types are basically a way of saying like uh, any element added to the DOM needs to have been created by a particular class. Um, so it's, a, it's an approach like Google has used, I think, for, for quite a while internally, and now they're, they're looking at actually adding it to the, to the CSP um, standard. So... Um, yeah, but I, I, I guess, so my personal opinion is that WebAssembly is, that securing WebAssembly is not a good fit for at least CSP as it is right now, because, because CSP is kind of like locking down these systems that people tend to use in insecure ways. Um, but it, it doesn't go so far as to like stop you from loading regular JavaScript that, for example, provides like a, a Turing complete, um, you know, uh, DOM selector that works from the hash in the URL. Um, so, uh, um, like, I mean, fr from my perspective, like the likelihood of 
mixing user um, user input with a WebAssembly module in a insecure way is very very small. Um, but yeah, that's 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 my perspective on on that. So I, th I think this is this is a good time. I guess well, the the last point is that like what we what we need is a tool or well, not necessarily need, but having a tool that allows us to be more explicitly restrictive of capabilities, um, even, even in the case of like porting legacy code. Um, cause I, cause I do believe like if you're writing code, if you're writing a WebAssembly module from scratch and your goal is to have a secure, um, to provide secure capabilities, that is very straightforward to do. Um, but we have a there, hand from, uh, Daniel has a question. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I, I mean, I can ask that at the end after you're done. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah. So sorry. So <laughs> well, I'm just. Uh, yeah. It's just like I think providing something like SES where you can wrap those imports in something that's a more restrictive environment even gives us the ability with like legacy systems where we like understand. All right, I'm I'm porting. You know, I'm porting blasts to um so for the uh, like a linear algebra solver. Um, mm -hmm. I'm porting that to the web. Like I should be able to, even though it's, you know, it, it's probably going to get compiled with them script and it's going to put imports in there that are going to over permission it. Um, I should be able to wrap those in such a way that's just like, you, you can't really do anything. You, you know, you can read your memory um, and, and that's it. Um, yes, that's, so. a that, that's a perfect example because the actual job the library is doing is purely computational. It doesn't need I.O. And any system that grants it I.O. that it quite clearly doesn't need has already um, uh, you know, gone down the wrong road for, for security. Yeah, I, I will say at least like Mscripten virtualizes a lot of I.O. Um, and so we'll oftentimes make it look like it has um, like access to like files. Um, and stuff that are all still strictly internal to the WebAssembly. Yeah, have you been following the WASI project? I haven't. Okay, I, I participated. Oh, yes, oh, sorry, sorry. I, my brain put a Y at the end of that and that completely, uh -huh. uh, WSA, uh, yeah, I have been. Okay, um, good. Uh, so uh, uh, so uh, the WASI project is explicitly tr trying to use WASM uh, as a capability system where different module instances can be granted different authority and, and composed in a least authority manner. This uh, is, and they, I, th I think Lynn Clark did a presentation yes. on this. Last, yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, um, yeah, Lynn Clark is, is one of the leaders of the, the, the whole WASI thing as is, um, um, oh God, I can't remember the name. Um, in any case, um, the, um, uh, there is one technological step at the WASM level that they need to assume and that uh, in order to treat it as an expressive capability system, which is WASM as it comes out of the box uh, has no ability to dynamically pass capabilities between module instances. The only ca capabilities are uh, the static imports and exports of function. Um, so, uh, so there's this proposal that's already partially implemented or fully implemented, maybe in some uh, WASM machines, which is reference types, which is a small first step towards GC, but it's a standalone step. Mm -hmm. um, and that basically gives you the ability to um, take a, the, the concept of a pointer to a function and turn it into a opaque thing that can be passed as uh, function arguments uh, including between module instances. Now, there's a whole level of tooling that needs to happen around that that hasn't happened because all of the tooling around WASM assumes that all of the directly linked together, at least last I looked, all of the directly linked together module instances all share the same memory and any func table. So they use the same indices to index into functions. And if they share those tables, then there's no, pr there's no protection. Um, the tooling needed to generate code that uses reference types as function pointers and keeps the memories and any func tables separate, uh, as far as I know, is still not there. 
Yeah, I actually I think the I think reference types are actually phase four, so they're very close to actually landing. Excellent. So, but any, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and reference types are, um, yeah, in, in any case, yeah, I think that's that's a good summary of them. So I, I think any other questions or discussion, I think is now is a, a great time. Okay, I guess I can jump in now. Uh, I think it's good good presentation, good to, to bring thought to this. I wanted to talk more about how this relates to um, well, first of all, you mentioned CSP and how different browsers have different semantics with CSP in WebAssembly. Yes. I just want to say, I think the fact that they have different semantics is already really bad. And yeah. it came out of, historically, it came out of how uh, the browsers just disagreed with each other. And somehow everybody just decided to ship it anyway, even though they knew they disagreed with each other. Yep. So I think a, a concerted effort to... Uh, come to common semantics and ship them in all browsers would just be useful in itself for interoperability, even if it doesn't offer that much. Yeah. Security. I, and, and honestly, like the, a lot of the reasons behind like kind of the, like looking into this is, is, uh, is the annoyance at like where CSP is for me because it leaves it, you know, it kind of it kind of sucks to have to like disable um, kind of one of the the bigger CSP protections. I don't have to do it for Firefox. I sort of don't have to do it for Chrome. I have to do it for Safari. So it it's kind of I'm with you. Like it's yeah, it's been it sounds, over three years. That sounds very very bad. And yeah. my understanding is there's no active effort on this. So I think it, it would be worth it to. I mean, there's there's a repo, but there isn't. Yeah. Work going on in the repo, um, and I've wanted to work on this in the past when I was when it was kind of part of my job, but it was considered low priority by other people. Yeah. So I think um, I think it would be worth it to make a particular effort to like explain to the WASM CG that this is high priority, that this is you know forcing lower CSP modes with you know in a broad way, and yeah. that's bad uh, yeah um i've been yeah i've been barking up that tree if you honestly like shoot me an email um cvon at gmail.com um and you know I'd, I'd like to follow this up online because like you know we we can commiserate i think one of the problems is like a lot of people have it's just kind of, it's a little bit cursed in the sense of like um people have like started up on it and kind of like got up to speed and then push it forward and then needed to move on to other things um i know ben smith was i think the last one looking at it and and he's now no longer with google um uh, uh, yeah, really i didn't know that um where where did ben go uh i'm not sure um at least the last the the last WASM CG I was at uh, wasn't necessarily the last one, um, but uh, I believe he, he announced he was stepping down, and I believe it was announced he was leaving Google. So don't if this is the this was is this the, a couple of years ago or no, more this, this would have been like two months ago, maybe a month okay. ago. Okay. So uh, I think I'll probably say hi to him then. Anyway. Uh, aside from that point, I wanted to make an entirely separate point, which was there's a proposal which I'm uh, not actively working on, but which I worked on in the past for making WebAssembly sort of implicitly part of the ES module graph. So you could just yeah. import a WebAssembly module. And yeah, this would give it all those permissions. And uh, I don't know whether or not we want to do that by default. Um, I can see both arguments. I mean, some people say, you know, WebAssembly is inherently kind of lower power than JavaScript, but really, as has been discussed in this call, JavaScript also has these nice properties where as long as you make sure it doesn't refer to things, it doesn't have a reference to them and it's kind of isolated that way. Yeah. So I'm not sure if they categorically differ they do differ in terms of how people think about them because 
there's a there's a large set of people who ascribe this property to WebAssembly and don't ascribe it to JavaScript. And I'm not sure what this should mean in terms of ES module integration for WebAssembly. And I I raised it recently again in an issue on the repository and because um, Anna Van Kestren from Mozilla raised it in a in a chat room and I mm -hmm. wanted to raise it to more people and the response that I got mostly was like, look, uh, it should it should have the same rights as JavaScript uh, modules and that restricting the, the capabilities of a module graph is just this orthogonal project that should kind of happen separately. I, Wait, well, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by orthogonal project that should happen separately. Um, the uh, I, I think I think that that uh, I mean our, our plans our plans for compartments and CES certainly um, in, you know incorporates uh, the idea that uh, WebAssembly modules should participate in the import graph and in fact um, uh, 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 Chris Kowal's uh, design for the uh, static module record uh, as a API. Uh, that others can participate in if they don't need live, live bindings, which WebAssembly does not, um, are such that um, uh, simply making a um, WebAssembly module uh, appear in uh, SES, in JavaScript, uh, as a static module record with that API uh, would, would uh, bring it in well. The reason I'm starting from CES here, or starting from compartments at least, is that you should be bringing it into a system in which you've already um, disaggregated authority into separate compartments. And then it becomes clear how to think about how, uh, about what authority to provide when you instantiate a WebAssembly module. There's been a hand from Bradley. Yeah, I've been wanting to ask a clarification given what we're talking about right now. Could you go to the logger slide where you're actually yeah. passing the login? Um, <clears throat> Is it not possible for the WebAssembly uh, code to access properties off log? Nope. Okay. It, the uh, only if you thing pass Web a function to WebAssembly that that reads properties, and you have the reference types proposal, then you can assemble some of these things, right? Yeah. So it would be about assembling like gadgets, but the only thing like this module is able to do is call log. It's the only way it's able to interact with it. And it can and, only call it as that yes. function. And also the, the WebAssembly verifier will always verify that you have two N32s on the stack ahead of it. Um, sure. And so, yeah, so you're, you're, that's, that WebAssembly guarantees that behavior. Um, You've mentioned so, the gadget a few times. Can you define that in this context? Gadget is kind of what I have in my mind as something that uh, is a WebAssembly import that provides it additional capabilities that, that aren't really well under understood um, or, or aren't really intended by the developer. Um, so that would be something, or, or that just kind of provides like an open ability to interact with JavaScript. So that would be stuff like, um, being able to, um, you know, reference, being able to save references to objects into um, a buffer it's later able to use. So the fact that like, the fact that we're restricted to interacting with the world with these primitive types, um, a gadget something that like helps translate those primitive interactions to more sophisticated JavaScript interactions. Um, so I'm guessing, I'm a bit curious about what exactly you want to constrain uh, from the WebAssembly side. Are you just looking for the ability to validate um, capabilities or are you looking for the ability to replace capabilities? Because it sounds like you don't want to modify the module. So here, if, if we were to send log, it would get the ability to basically log out a string. Mm -hmm. um, are, are you looking for the ability to kind of 
fail if it tries to use logs, say you don't provide it on purpose? Yeah. Or are you looking for the ability also to kind of intercept log to have a different behavior? Um, I, I think it's it's more the, the latter. So if, you know, especially in particular, like Mark was talking about, um, uh, you know, legacy code versus like new code. Um, so when you have, um, you know, if, if you're compiling something, you know, if, if you're porting a legacy application, the toolkit you're, you're using may provide just by its nature, um, a substantial uh, import interface. Um, so so I, I think one of the things is viewing the module as potentially compromised and what can we restrict in, in that sense? Um, so can you take like a arbitrarily written um, interface that provides a lot of capabilities and functionalities? Um, uh, can we wrap that in such a way that we can be like, this is, you know, this is the only, only set of things you're able to call um, type of thing. Sure. Um, and I guess, I guess that leads to the question of uh, what would that replacement exactly be? So if you have interlinked WASM modules, they're usually within the same, I don't know what you call it, package bundle. Yeah, I'm, I'm less focused on kind of like the interlinking of, of modules okay. and more so focused on the host WASM host. boundary. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the WASI and the permissioning from module to module is another thing. And that's a part of that is, is how do we, you know, get to that on the web where we're able to like have JavaScript pass like, um, you know, distinct capabilities to, to WebAssembly. Well, so provided, in, in a way, I see this presentation as a gift of a uh, very clear use case of compartments, as Mark as Mark mentioned. Provided that, uh, provided that, the capabilities that a WebAssembly module receives have to be explicitly threaded, and it seems that they do. Um, it would it would presumably be possible. Um, so, so one 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 thing that's less clear is that there's uh, one thing that's not clear is how we would how would we differentiate with the compartment API the capabilities that are passed into a WebAssembly module by virtue of something analogous to imports versus those that are passed in in a way that's analogous to um, endowments in the compartment API. Yeah. Uh, but if we were to just make the yeah. simplifying assumption that they are all imports, the compartment API already gives us the ability, but well, either way, whichever you choose, the compartment API would give us the ability to, um, uh, to compartmentalize a, a, a set of WebAssembly modules so that they can reach out to each other and import and export anything that they need to do for interlinkage. Uh, and then they would reach out to the compartment for any capability or power, powerful modules that they need. Um, and, uh, and the compartment API with the static module record interface uh, would be uh, the, the, all we would need to close that gap would be a, a well-defined um, WebAssembly static module record. I think that's yeah. exactly right, and I think that's exactly right. And I think that um, the uh, imports, the web, the WebAssembly notion of imports and exports, uh, map directly to the uh, compartment notion of import and exports. And the compartment, you know, has control of the import namespace, so it's the perfect mechanism for controlling authority available by importing it. Uh, and the other notion, the endowments, uh, and the whole notion of a shared global object that's that's accessible across a compartment, uh, I think has no analog in WebAssembly, which is good. 
So, it, so WebAssembly would really only be about uh, the import namespace um, and conceivably the host hooks if there's part, observable parts of a WebAssembly of WebAssembly semantics that are provided by the host, but I'm not aware of any such thing. So may, maybe it's just the imports. I mean, you could imagine something like in a CSP saying like, I'll only allow WebAssembly instantiation if the imports are a container or compartment. Hmm, I see. What, what I'm trying to understand how WebAssembly differs from JavaScript in any of these senses, because JavaScript can also be used in a contained way. And so why, why are we associating this with like whether it's WebAssembly? I think this might uh, just be a statement about uh, what WebAssembly is by default, not the JavaScript can't be done in a constrained way. Um, so I do have an outstanding question, though, about the idea of using the import behavior. Uh, since WebAssembly doesn't really have a canonical address, it's just instantiated from bytes. Um, how are we going to actually associate what capabilities any individual WebAssembly module is allowed to have? Because we don't have an ID to reference them by. I, I um, don't understand. I don't, Bradley, I don't understand the question. Sure. Uh, let's say we have a JavaScript module and it's a text parser and we provide it capabilities uh, via import. Uh, and it is not allowed to import, I don't know, some HTTP client. And okay. then we have another one, it's a different module that is allowed to import this HTTP client. In okay. general, the way we've discussed it previously has been the uh, referrer, parent, dependent, whatever you want to call it, uh, is able to uh, determine the access granted to that HTTP client. It seems to me that WebAssembly can't import anything. That's not a capability that it has. It's, it is provided only with the endowments that the host grants it. The memory well, and the functions and the, you know, the, the data and the functions basically. That's all it has. It can't get more. I'm, I'm not objecting <clears throat> to that. I believe that to be true as well. I'm, roughly stating that here we have this ENV that we're providing in this example. And we don't really have a way to reference, back reference, uh, what is allowed to be in that ENV. Let me, let me um, uh, I, I think that what, what your, your, this, the, this statement has, uh, has revealed to me that there is actually a problem with using compartments for this. And that is that the that what is injected into a WebAssembly module um, is injected by name only and not by a module identifier name uh, mapping. Um, so if it's importing log, for example, it's not clear what module log should come from. Um, Why is so that in that, go ahead. Sorry. Why is that different than, I mean, in, uh, in JavaScript, uh, ESM modules, the actual specifier mentioned in a module source text is only a string as, as you and Bradley both mentioned, it's interpreted relative to refer, but, the, but, but what compartments are doing is they're using the refer relative only to turn it into a, um, a, a string that's relative to the compartment rather than relative to the referrer. And uh, the, the, the string is rel as relative to the compartment. Uh, um, there's only one module instance that's going to be uh, instantiated that corresponds to that string in the, in the compartment. So a difference, you know, multiple instantiations of the same um, uh, static module with different authorities, as in Bradley's original example, would have to be uh, instantiations uh, of that um, uh, in different compartments. Within any one compartment, 
the same static module only has one instantiation with one set of authorities. And that seems consistent with, with uh, all the constraints from WebAssembly. The, the, oh. the module itself only specifies a string and then it's up to the importing context for us, the compartment, to uh, dereference that string into the thing that should be linked to. Uh, I wouldn't object to that if we actually did control that. But if you look at the code here during instantiate, it's passed in directly by a reference. And I don't understand how we're going to intercept that. So I think I'm not understanding the code I'm looking at here. Can somebody talk, talk me through what this code means? Yeah, so um, we fetch the, the raw bytes that define that are the compiled version of this. <clears throat> and then um, we take those bytes and we create a, uh, an instantiated WebAssembly module from it, passing in this as the imports. Okay, hold, so, hold on. Yeah. Uh, the, there's already something I'm confused about. Uh, last time I looked at WebAssembly, there were two distinct steps that looked like they're being folded together here. Yes. There was turning bytes into a module, which was it's a static concept. And then mm -hmm. there's a separate step of instantiating a module by binding the imports. Yeah, so, so in this case, you can pass a module, a WebAssembly module object into instantiate and that will have come from a compile. Um, okay. Or if you pass the raw bytes object, it composes those two operations. Okay, so, so, the, so the second argument here, env colon log memory, mm -hmm. uh, env is, um, uh, okay, so env corresponds to uh, the, the, the module name and memory corresponds, I mean, just thinking in terms of uh, ESM terminology, I don't remember how the terminology maps, but env is basically the, the, the uh, name for looking up a module and memory is the name of an exported variable within, within that module, is that correct? And, um, and what we're doing is we're providing in the instantiate here, we're saying um, uh, the module being instantiated uh, uh, where it names env uh, and um, needs a binding for the, for the variables memory and log provided these bindings. This, this is, this, thank you, Mark. That clarifies for me. There is no problem. Uh, and there is no problem for integrating that I, static module record. Um, I, I don't think the instantiation is the problem. The problem is actually providing the lesser capabilities. Yeah, for, for that purpose, I think that the an, the answer is as Mark suggested that we that if you wish to do that, you would need to um, instantiate a separate compartment. Um, so maybe I'm confused. Then, what would we be doing if we're not able to redirect any of these? We are able to redirect. I, I'm not. I'm not even clear on what what would be redirected. So, so the whole argument is people like mscripten are providing overly powerful APIs. Yes. Yep. We must continue to provide exports for those in order for instantiation to occur. Mm -hmm. For the names. Provide... Mm -hmm. For the for the names, not not but but what we bind to those names is up to us. Uh, they must be stubs of some kind kind yes. in order to pass type checking. Yes. Right. Um, if we go to the JavaScript example, when we do call instantiate, the mscripten wrapper will still always provide the values in that object with the powerful capabilities. We want to intercept those powerful capabilities. But could back up one step there. So when yep. you, the, the instantiation of we go to the JavaScript this code, code it's it's providing it with the the data to be used for those names. Correct. And it can only provide it with with values that it itself has. So so this code here can provide log and memory because they are in scope. Correct. But but that would be true if instead of WebAssembly.instantiate, you had 
any other function to which you were providing log and memory, you can only provide what you have. So I, I'm not seeing anything WebAssembly specific here. It's a JavaScript concern around if log is powerful, how, how, does, how, is it, how is access to it by this code controlled? But this code is JavaScript code, not WebAssembly. If, if well, the JS has it, then it can provide it to WebAssembly. If it doesn't have it, then it can't provide it to WebAssembly. The problem is in script and in things do provide the powerful thing. And we need- Well, but they're, they're running in some context themselves, right? And if that context has, has the powerful bindings, then in scripting has them. And if that context does not have the powerful bindings, then in scripting does not. Uh, I think what I am hearing is we do not do anything to WebAssembly. We only guard the JavaScript ability to access bindings. Yeah, I, yeah, I think, I think that makes sense. sense. Yeah, yeah, I think I think I would. First of all, I think that is a consistent stance and and, and fits the and, and satisfies the constraints. I do think though that the code that we're seeing right now, uh, that's that's JavaScript code generated by Inscripten to cause the instantiation. Uh, I would like to just see the uh, notion of of WebAssembly under compartments replace this code. That this Agreed. code. That you know that 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 the the generation of the module the the WASM modules themselves from Inscript and we keep that, but all of the wiring created by Inscript and like the code on the screen right now, uh, that would be replaced by wi just wiring up com uh, compartments and import graphs. Yeah, and, and I think Inscript and would absolutely. I mean, I, I can imagine you know if there's. Uh, I don't know if there's a compartments polyfill, but we could probably throw together something pretty quickly with Inscript and that would just sort of demonstrate like, hey, you know, if you look at how powerful of an interface inbind is, because um, uh, it, it inbind lets you, um, lets you in C++ take references to any JavaScript object through its own like machinery. Um, and so like being able to like show, like we can be very explicit about the permissions we get. I think that would be pretty powerful. Well, it just you know. so happens <laughs> there is, in fact, a compartment polyfill. Great. Let me take a look at that over the break. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we call it a shim, but we're very proud of it. <laughs> so just to carry on the thread a bit, Daniel did speak about the ability for WebAssembly to participate in host hooks for importing. I think if that were possible, this story would become much more complicated. Uh, because here we still wouldn't have an identifier. Is that right, Dan? Uh, so in a case, I'm, I'm just, the, sorry to, to back up the, the WebAssembly ESM integration proposal doesn't do anything different with the WASM JS APIs that's used here. The entry point would be like, an import statement or a script tag that points to a WebAssembly module. And then that module would be entirely in the ES module graph. We could do okay. so, so, some other thing, which is kind of in the middle that works with the WebAssembly JS API, but it, it really is kind of like two entirely separate worlds, the JS API module graphs and the you know, so, ESM module graphs. At least the JS APIs as they exist today are not expected to be granted those host hooks. Oh, definitely, definitely not. What I was imagining possibly along the lines of what Chris was talking about is maybe one day we would allow you to dynamic, to pass into dynamic import a WebAssembly dot module. And that, that would be kind of the equivalent if we think about WebAssembly modules being module blocks or module specifiers or static module records then that's a thing that you pass into dynamic import and then dynamic import will fill in the, you know, hook up the, that realm's module graph to it. Against the but current one, 
I guess. That, that, sorry, you, Dan, you said that realms module graph. I want, just want to make clear. You're talking about that compartments module graph. Oh, sorry, that compartments module graph, sorry. Uh, yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I was thinking because my mind has been on the realms proposal and how that hooks into HTML's module graph semantics, but that's just in the absence of the compartment proposal. Yeah, that's why I said okay. so we are for one over time, uh, but the conversation's good. I'd like to keep it going. Um, I just uh, thank you everybody who uh, has come, who has uh, has a hard stop. Um, the on the on the topic of linking um, linking WebAssembly modules in the same way that we would link module blocks, um, the dynamic import would of course need to be only one. It would need to be one of. It isn't even necessary. It, it is a possible mechanism for introducing a as a module to a module graph. Um, the, but it's, it's, it does so in a way that it's anonymous. Um, a named introduction would have to come through the load hook. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah but, but, but es essentially the same idea. So like my, my big concern here is the way that nodes loaders work, not having a referrer is really bad. And as shown by Shu about incumbent incumbent realm settings objects in the web you can often get the wrong thing if you just default to the global um mappings of stuff i so, I, I, I did not follow that uh, since we're out of time i'll have to request a clarification either offline or next time but i did i did not follow that sure uh, it's a very tiny explanation basically in the HTML spec, there are some functions that don't have realms associated with them. Oh, oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, that's complete browser specific crap that will not show up on any other host. But it, well, but in this sense, module blocks always do have a refer, right? Because they always syntactically exist somewhere. Blocks right. do, uh, but uh, at least for any design we have in the future, WebAssembly.module would not. Yep, I, I agree with that. And that's a really interesting point. We would start to fall back on document-wide stuff. And it would be weird. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not yeah, convinced. I think, think if, if the module is analogous to a static module record, static module records do not themselves have a named position within the module yeah. specifier space. Um, that that is uh, that is implied um, uh, by uh, that is implied by external mechanism. Also, Bradley, if I'm remember, if if I understand correctly, which mechanism that that you're referring to that she raised, uh, it's not a refer relative issue; it's a realm relative issue. Is that what? If, if, if some things refer relative, then I think I did, still didn't understand what you're referring it to. It is complicated. It is referrer, but it is based on the stack, not on lexical. Oh, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't think that we've accounted for that in the compartment proposal at all. Yeah, I don't, and, I, and I don't think we ever will. This, 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 has, this, should, this, this browser specific legacy crap has no place in a language standard or a WASM standard. It, I'm this just should state. trying to state that we will recreate a similar issue if we don't actually have the capability to produce a referrer when we try to import. Okay, that I'm not understanding. Um, I, 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 th I think that you're objecting to passing the module as, a, as an argument to dynamic import, which, I, which I'm fine with, uh, I think that you can you can pass it, but it just needs to actually have a well-defined resolve behavior. Why can't the if you're passing it as a first-class thing, why can't it just represent the resolved thing rather than the input to resolve? Because if you import the, dependency, the, the question is resolved. imports within the module. How are those URLs resolved? What is their base URL? And one answer would be to say they just have to be absolute paths. I see, I see. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, uh, at the moment, the compartments proposal does not have a, a mechanism for injecting a static module record in the 
in the position of the first argument to own the sole argument to uh, dynamic import. Um, okay. That is think... that is implied by the um, that is implied to be something that would need to be added to the compartment API by the module block proposal as written. Uh, hold on, there's two different dynamic imports that we need to keep distinct here. There's the the existing JavaScript language dynamic import expression. Pardon, I already... meant compartment import. Okay, okay. Because the, the other one, the, the one that's already in the language is refer relative. Yes. Okay. Um, I think that we should call time. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you very much, Charles. Yeah, thank you all. This is a really good conversation. Um...